So despite cutting a ton of gears recently, you'd think that making a simple timing belt pulley would be just as straightforward. But as it turns out, it isn't. I mean in fairness to it, it's not really a difficult thing to make. From what I can gather, this is known as an HDT 5M timing belt, and it is probably the easiest type to make in the home shop. Well, easiest if you have a milling machine and a dividing head on hand. And the reason for that is that at its core, the teeth are simply a 1.5mm radius arc with about half a millimeter extra depth to form these straight sides. And on face value, this is simply a job for a ball radius end mill, and it probably would be that way if the milling machine could go about two to three times as fast as it can currently go. You see, the problem is, is that when I picked the motor, when I did the motor swap a few years ago, I got a model that did about 1000 RPM, and that's to maximize the torque at the spindle speeds that I usually need. Anywhere from about 6 to 1200 RPM, which is pretty normal for regular sized cutters in steel. But unfortunately that is very low for small cutters in, well, pretty much anything. Now thankfully with the VFD, it does let you push the RPM closer to about 2000, but that is still a bit low for a 1.5mm radius ball end mill, especially in aluminium. And it also doesn't help that with ball end mills, as you get closer to the center of the cutting edge, the rotational speed drops to pretty much zero. So whilst the outside may be running at a usable RPM, the closer we get to the center, it'll be way too slow. And that usually leads to a higher tool pressure. And whilst I can get away with it with my 6mm and larger cutters, I doubt I'd be as lucky with a 1.5mm radius cutter. It also doesn't help that I recently did some machining with a 2.5mm cutter, spitting at about 2000 RPM, and despite me taking it easy, I still lost a chunk out of one of the flutes. Now it wasn't the most expensive end mill, but it was an important lesson. So instead of end mills, let's try a different approach. Now my original approach was going to be to try and copy these. These are involute profile cutters, which I used to make the gears. Looking at it, it's obviously been machined from a piece of round bar, with the side profile being machined to match the gear tooth shape. It's then had relief cut in to prevent any rubbing, and then a cutting edge that's been cut in so that it can cut. And a big advantage of copying this is that I already have a tool holder which you can work with. However, on face value, whilst making this may seem simple initially, being able to actually create the relief is not so straightforward. If you couldn't already tell, the cutter is not a true circle. The area behind the teeth have been ground away so that it curves down and forms a true relief. Now if the profile was more squared, like what we see in a T-slot cutter, we could easily come in with a grinding wheel or an end mill and simply remove that back material to form relief. This is no different from when I made my own T-slot cutter and it worked without issue. Unfortunately because the profile that we're working with isn't square, that method won't work as well as it did here. So I knew that there had to be an easier way. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for a simple single point cutter which should give me an accurate profile for cutting with the proper relief cut in. So for the materials I have some 4140 that I'm going to use for the tool holder. It didn't have to be 4140, it could have been 1020 or something else but this is in the right size so it'll work here. I also have some O1 tool still for the cutter. Again O1 will work fine but W1 or anything similar should work just fine. And finally we have some brass which I originally was going to use as some shim but this will be replaced later on in the video so for the moment you can ignore that. So the first thing we'll do is make the tool holder. which should be pretty straightforward to do because we've made similar ones in the past. Now the most important thing is that the tool holder is long enough so that the bottom end of it is at the centre line of the dividing head. If it's not long enough the spindle will crash into the dividing head or the chuck which has happened before with other tools that weren't long enough. So the tool holder needs to be just over 90mm long. So we'll get it cut off and then cleaned up in the lathe.
With the tail stock now supporting it, we'll now start to get the shank made. Now I'm going to be making this a little bit longer than I normally would. The reason for it is that if I ever need to hold it in an ER collet, I can push the tool in a little bit further than I could do with a Morse taper collet. And this just gives me a bit more flexibility with the tool in the future when I use it for different projects. With that said, it'll probably look a little bit weird when it's in the mill with the Morse taper collet. Okay, so the first pass was alright. 4140 always looks amazing, but it can be a bit difficult to break a chip if the speeds and feeds aren't perfect. It's definitely taking a lot of power to do this, but there is still a bit of breathing room, so let me bump up the feed and see if it works any better. Okay, that is certainly a lot better than it was, but it's still not breaking a chip like I want. Let me change around a few more settings and then we'll go again. Now once again, 4140 is definitely overkill for a tool like this. But again, I didn't have any other stock on hand in the right size, and at least on the bright side, 4140 is a bit more rust resistant than a normal mild steel, which is good news for a tool like this. And after a fair amount of machining, we're now down to a 20mm shank. So I'll now get the part out, and before I machine down the other side, I'll get the three jaw chuck ripped off and then replaced with the collet chuck. And that is the lathe work now done. We now need to get it in the mill and get the slot cut. Now in a perfect world, I'd like to lay it flat in the vise and then come in with a T-slot cutter or something similar and then mill the slot this way. Doing this would be a lot more rigid and a lot easier on my cutters. But unfortunately at the moment, I just don't have a cutter that could create deep enough cuts. So instead what I'll do is I'll stand it up and then take light cuts and then just hope that it doesn't move. So using an end mill, we'll come in and then machine in a slot on the centre line of the holder. In a perfect world, it would be a two flute cutter, but I just don't have one in a small enough size. I'll then come around to the front and then mill in a flat. This will be for a set of grub screws for holding the cutter and shim in place. With the holes now drilled and tapped for the grub screws, the final thing I need to do is come in with a hacksaw and then relieve the inside corners. And the reason for that is that end mills don't leave a perfectly sharp corner, so I need to come in and relieve them. Alright, and that's the holder now done. The next thing that we need to do is get a piece of tool steel cut. This will be our tool blank. As it is at the moment, it's a little bit oversized, so I'll machine it down a little bit to better fit in the tool holder. Now O1 is quite tough to machine, so I'll use carbide to remove a bulk of the material. Yeah. <laughs> 
And that is the tool blank now done. Finally, I'll get some 3mm steel cut down and use it as some shim stock. Alright, and that's the tool holder and the cutter blanks now made. What we need to do now is turn the blank into a 1.5mm radius cutter. Now there are a few different ways that we can approach this, but for me, the easiest would probably be to make a negative pattern cutter and then cut a positive from it. So with the piece now cut, we'll then clean up the end and then add some bottom clearance on the cutting end. I also need to remove some material from the bottom because the end mill that I'm going to be using isn't very long. Now to make the negative pattern itself, I'm going to be using a 3mm carbide end mill. But instead of using the mill, I'm going to do this with it held in the lathe. It's a bit more rigid to do it this way, plus I already have the collet chuck installed and ER32 is the only collet that I have in the size that will hold the small end mill. So after the first cut is done, I'll angle the tool post a little bit and then take a second cut and this will be to add clearance to the cutter. And that is the negative profile cut. With the negative now done, we can now go ahead and harden it. Now because this is O1 tool steel, I'm going to be using canola oil as a quench oil. It's not perfect and it does leave a bit of residue on the part, but it'll be more than good enough for this sort of tool. Now for heating the steel, whilst this is not critical, it's best practice to get it red hot and then let it soak at this temperature for about a minute. And this allows the austenite to fully form. With it now quenched, I'll then pop it in the oven and then get back to you once that's all done. Alright, so we've now made our cutter negative. So what we want to do now is make the cutter itself. But before we do that, there are two things that we do need to consider. Number one is that when we're making the cutter, we want the shim to be placed in front of it so that it's offset back. And this is critical for creating the clearance behind the cutting edge. Number two is to remove as much of the excess material as we can using the milling machine. It probably isn't critical, but it should allow us to avoid chatter by allowing us to take lighter cuts. I'm also going to cut the profile with the tool spinning backwards. Doing this should help the negative profile from chipping. Okay, so 80 RPM is a little bit low. Let me bump it up to about 140. So I'm taking this extra slow, but so far it seems to be cutting well. Alright, that still looks pretty good. I was worried about it starting to chatter once the front started to engage, but so far the cut is still looking pretty smooth. And after enough cutting, that to me looks like a fully formed cutter. Say what you want, but I am pretty blown away by the results. More importantly though, it fits perfectly into the timing belt pulley, which is really the most important thing here. And also importantly, we've also been able to create some nice clearance behind the cutter too. Almost looks professional. Well, at least almost anyway. 
Unfortunately, there isn't any side clearance, and I think you'd need some sort of CNC setup to achieve that. But the reality is, back clearance is the most important here, and that is really what I was aiming for. Now to make this actually work as clearance, what we need to do now is flip its position with the shim. This will bring it forward to be almost on center line with the tool holder. Alright, and that is cutting pretty nicely. The great thing about this type of tool is that it only needs a few hundred RPM to achieve adequate cutting speed, as opposed to the several thousand that I was going to need if I was going to do this with an end mill. With that said though, you do need to take it easy with this cutter. The cutting geometry is still pretty basic and it is a single cutting edge, so it needs to take its time in order to cut. In the end though, I'm still pretty happy with the final result. Definitely very usable, that is the profile that I wanted, it's just a little bit slow. More importantly though, this is a fairly simple profile that I'm cutting here, and this sort of setup would be perfectly suited if I needed a more complex profile. So with that in mind, I'm definitely going to be trying this out sometime in the future when it's needed. But for the moment, with this very simple radius cutter, you'll be seeing it pop up in a project very soon. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.